Amen. We recording? Amen. Let's pray. Uh, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you and we honor you. We give you praise and glory because you are good and because you're God. I thank you tonight, Father, for this time of fellowship and interaction. And I thank you, Lord, for all that you are going to say to us. Now, Father, our prayer is lead us into this study. Let us see, oh God, what you want us to see. Let us hear what you want us to hear. I thank you. That Father, that you are transforming this Zoom, not in even not not even into a classroom, but to a place, uh, Father, where it is just you and us. Father, I thank you, Lord, individually. Although you are speaking to us as a group, I thank you that you make this space conducive for personal encounter. Father, although there is something prepared, take us where you want us to go. We surrender and we yield. Father, we literally say that this space is yours to do as you will. Have your divine way among us in the name of Jesus. Father, I do decree and declare by the power and by the spirit of you that as you lead us into this, that you make us more like you, that you take off what needs to be taken off and that you help us to put on and carry and bear and walk with everything that we need to put on. I thank you, Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, that you are helping us become more like you, that you are changing our reflection, that you're changing our attitude, that you are changing our posture, that you're changing our perspective, that you are changing our perception. I give you praise in the name of Jesus because the individuals that we see ourselves as today, we will know ourselves as this version of ourselves no more and no longer. I thank you, Father, that you are changing us, that you are challenging us, that you are shaping and molding and shifting us. Father, you are adjusting and realigning us so that we can uh, bring you glory as we uh, share your love with others. We thank you for it. And we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I almost got lost. <laughs> mm -mm. Let's not do that uh, so soon. Uh, but I do want to say by way of announcement, August the 4th is coming. Uh, I am super, super, super excited uh, that we will be in person uh, on August the 4th, 2024. Uh, if you are in the DMV area, uh, please go ahead and join us. Uh, all the information will be out. I'll post the flyer tomorrow so that you'll have the address and the details. It's going to be an amazing time of uh, fellowship uh, with the Lord, fellowship with one another, and all the things and all the things. So join us if you can. It's going to be absolutely amazing. Uh, let's go ahead and let me play a little something in the background so we can go ahead and do what we got to do in the front ground. I don't know what the front ground is, but it's going to be the front ground. It's going to be what it's going to be today. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen. Let's go this route. Let's go this route. All right. So uh, we're in week five of You Smell Like Jesus, uh, this book, this awesome book that we are studying. Um, and it's amazing. So tonight, uh, our agenda is that we're going to recap last class. Um, we're going to ask those questions. And we're going to talk about our personal lessons. Uh, we're going to look at the questions at the end of that chapter, and then we're going to look at the five letters, and then I'm going to let you all go. All right? Uh, that's our agenda tonight. <laughs> and uh, let's go ahead and dive on in. All right. So uh, before we go there, uh, is there anything that stood out to you? Anything that you are still digesting or uh, walking with, working through from uh, last week's meeting uh, that PJ2 so greatly and brilliantly led? Is there anything from last week that you are still saying, you know what, I need to work on that a little bit more, or you know what, I'd, I'm just trying to become in that way or in that space? So if it is, go ahead and let me know. You can say it in the chat, or you can feel free to take yourself off mute whichever you want to do and uh yeah let us know what's going on with you hey y'all uh, okay yeah. so quickly i'm uh, uh i'm off camera but i'm going to talk all right so <laughs> uh one of the things that the lord um one of, one of the lessons that i learned last week even in teaching um was to submit to one lesson at a time um, I think I repeated it a billion times at the end because I was really trying to rehearse it for myself. I have a tendency uh, to want to rush and skip lessons. Um, and sometimes I want to be like, are we done with this lesson yet? Can we skip this lesson yet? Like, can we can we just get to Z? And um, knowing that one, God is teaching me submission 
as an overall general theory of my life, right? A uh, pattern or the thing I need to work on. Um, but in that, submitting to learning, submitting to whatever lesson we are on and not looking ahead because looking ahead will um, probably make me a little bit more anxious. If I would just submit to the lesson, then I would be okay most of the time. That's the one of the things that stuck out um, and encouraged me from last week is that it is okay to submit to whatever lesson we're on and and dive into that. That's it. All right. Amen. Thank you so much. Anyone else? Uh, one of the things that I love about what you just said um, is submitting to one lesson at a time. That is absolutely necessary and it is key. Um, I think that a lot of times we have a tendency. Uh, it's one of the things that the Lord showed me about the way that I clean my home, right? Um, I would start in one room and if I have shoes in the living room, I'll take them in the bedroom and then I'll start cleaning up the bedroom. And then I have something in the bedroom that needs to go in the kitchen and then I'll start cleaning up the kitchen. And then I do a little bit of something in every room. And by the end of that, I still have accomplished nothing. The living room is not quite clean. The bedroom isn't quite clean. The kitchen isn't quite clean, but I'm tired because I've exhausted effort and I've done these things, but I've not done them in an order or in a way where they need to be done so that, that the job can be done. Um, and so I was like, you know, I just don't understand and blah, blah, blah. He was like, Justin, it's because you didn't clean one whole room, right? You didn't do one whole job. You did a little bit here and a little bit there, but you did not complete it. And so now uh, what I'll do is if I'm cleaning a particular area of my apartment, I will clean that area first. If it's shoes, all the shoes is just going to get dumped in the room. How many pairs of shoes do I wear at one time? One, but it may be five or six or eight. Don't worry about it. But again, I will do that and then I'll clean all of those things up in the living room and then I'll move to the bedroom. And then once that's done, I can move to another room so that I can see more of what I've done. I can see effort. I can see that something has been done, that progress has been made in an area uh, looking at it from that perspective. And in that same way, the other thing that I found interesting, and we'll talk about this a little bit towards the end of tonight, is that when it comes down oftentimes to the work that we do uh, in our lives concerning getting things right or being right or, or getting things in order, Oftentimes, we tend to do that based on what we believe is wrong with us. I know I'm, I'm talking. I'm teach preaching already. We will try to go through these moments of deliverance and fasting and all of these other things based on what we believe is wrong with us. I know I got to do this and I got this and I got to fix this and I got to handle this and all of the things and all the things. When the reality is God may not even be as the old folks would say, studying that. And when I realized that the things that I was most concerned about in my life with fixing and adjusting and cutting out and all of these things that God wasn't tripping about, it freed me in an area, but it also allowed me to sit down and sit back and relax uh, and really learn how to go with and be in the flow of God. We love talking about flowing with God as it relates to being in the spirit and prophesying and all of these other things. But I wonder how many of us know how to flow with God as it relates to uh, us living righteous lives. I'm going to leave it alone. That's PJ 2s lesson. Uh, anyone else <laughs> want to share uh, something that stood out to you from last week's class? Woo. If I didn't stop, I was going to get in trouble. Yes, I was. All right. All right, let me go back to sharing. Sharing, 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 sharing. All right. Uh, so let's go ahead and dive right on in. Um, we want to talk a little bit about our personal lessons, all right? What is Jesus teaching you, and how was he doing that? And PJ2 added a question last week that I want us to adopt. How do you feel about it? <laughs> all right, I'll share this with you all because it's relevant 
uh, and you'll probably hear about it next week in our Three Minute Thursday, um, is that inspiration is not enough. I may have shared this before, but one of the things the Lord is sharing with me is that inspiration is not enough. It is not enough. Um, I was being inspired, encouraged by something that someone was doing that is very, is literally identical to something I do. And the Lord said, how long are you going to look at that and draw inspiration from it and not do anything after that? Um, he challenged me to get some things done. So I'm in the process of doing that. And next week you all will see the fruit of what he has said. Uh, Cause that's just how me and Craig grow. But it, it, inspiration is not enough. Yes, we need it to encourage ourselves and to stir our faith to increase our measure of faith, but we've got to be more than inspired if we're going to do what God is asking us to do. And if we're going to obey him the way he is uh, wanting us to obey him. Um, so that is my lesson that Jesus is teaching me. And that is uh, how he's teaching me. Um, how do I feel about it? I did not like it in the moment on Sunday when he said it, I was just, I was mad. I was upset. Um, and when PJ2 texted me and was like, hey, come get Craig, I was like, I quite honestly don't want to talk to him right now because of the way he talked to me this morning. I don't like it. Um, I still feel some type of way about it, but it's all good. Uh, it is for my betterment, and I am learning to partner with the promise of God. I'm going to leave that alone. That's your Selah moment. But we've got to learn how to partner with the promises of God so that we can see them in our lives. All right. Um, so anyone else, what lesson is Jesus teaching you? How is he doing that and how do you feel about it? While you're preparing, give me one moment. Um, it's okay for the same lesson to keep coming up week after week after week. There are some things that he will speak to us that are not done or resolved in one day, in one week, in one moment. Um, but it is my prayer that if you are still in the same lesson, that he is revealing something different to you about yourself or about his nature, about his character, uh, so that you are growing in the faith and growing in grace and knowledge of who God is. Um, but it is okay to repeat or, or to present the same thing multiple times so that uh, you can get all that he wants you to get. All right. Go on, PJ. So I think I just like I think I told a little bit about the overarching message is submission, um, learning how to listen and respond. <laughs> but the way he's doing it is not the way that I figure he would. I guess you know um, I figured it would be like more like okay I want you to go and teach on this topic or go and share on that whatever. Um, but it happens where I'm trying to be invisible. Um, <laughs> I was trying to, my sister had a client, um, with her uh, doing nails and I was literally trying to be invisible, not trying to make too much noise. And my sister was like, so, um, me, you had to preach this Sunday? No, I do not have to preach this Sunday. And her client asked me, how do you look, prepare for your messages? And then I was like, oh, so you. So you you want me to talk now? Got it. So it's learning to <laughs> it's learning to stop and and realize that this is an opportunity to not uh, glaze over, but to submit to what God is doing. And and of course, uh, that one conversation turned into what God was actually after. And so sometimes my submission to one thing means submission to three things. <laughs> Submission to all the things, right? Submission to, okay, if you got my yes, yes, you also have my yes in all my conversation. Um, so, yeah, that's what I was teaching me. How I felt about it, I, I want to be invisible. I like being invisible. It's fun. Um, you can get away with a lot when you're invisible. However, <laughs> I am submitted to being what God said and not what I want. So, that's that. Okay. Anyone else? Um, good evening. Um, oh, yeah. So lately, God has really been teaching me that I am a leader. <laughs> um, and that I can actually stand on his word and lead instead of me always having to go to others. I'm finding myself in a place where I'm asking God, I'm seeking God, I'm responding to what he's saying, 
and then I can lead others where I felt that I was better in the back. I always tell everybody, even in, when it comes to our church, I'm second, I'm behind the pastor, I'm this, I'm that. So God is putting me now in the place where I am finding myself where I am having to lead. Um, and it does not always feel good. Depending on the situation, <laughs> it does not always feel good depending on the situation and so but even like um me just said submitting to him and giving him the yes is necessary even with me having to leave so it does not always feel good um but i am finding myself that i have more strength than what i thought i have more ability than what i thought and even when i questioned what i thought i couldn't carry and do God is showing me, yes, you can. And so I'm opening my mouth wider. <laughs> if I can do that, right? Right. I'm opening my mouth bolder if I thought that I couldn't. So that's in the that's the way our God has me in this season that I am stronger than what I thought. Yeah. Amen. And it is something, you know, I think that as leaders, because that's who we are and what we are, um, it is interesting when we start to recognize and step in and stand in and walk in these moments, these identities, these titles, these positions, right? Um, having them and and literally like embracing and saying, you know what, this is what it is for real. Um, I think sometimes the timeline can look very, very different to us, um, look very, very different for us, but it is necessary. And I think that it is beautiful that the Lord is doing the things that he's doing when he's doing them, even though they may not make sense to us or other people around us. Um, and again, being a leader doesn't always feel good. There are some things that he requires of us and and here is one of the challenges for me as a leader, right? There's some things that God requires of us. And he'll say, I want you to do this to be an example for the people. And then the people don't do. And then the people oftentimes don't follow the example. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> they don't always do it. And that sometimes is a challenge. But one of the things, again, we talked about, I think it was week one or week two, is that are they following the principle of what you're doing, the principle of obedience and submission and giving God what he desires? Is that principle being followed? And if it is, then great. If it's not, we still lead, but then there may be some following or some subsequent conversations that need to happen uh, from and in that place of leadership that is also a part of the grace to lead. Amen. Anyone else before we go forward? Go ahead. Um, so in in this season, God has been basically telling me, teaching me to be still mm -hmm. and to sit still. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, most of my life, it has been, I've got to take care of everything. I've got to do everything. I've, I've got to take care of everybody else. I've got to be strong for everybody else. And, and this is like, no, you got to just sit still. Rome may be burning around you, but I just need you to sit still and trust that I am going to take care of everything else. I'm going to take care of everything. I'm going to handle everything. I got it. I just need you to sit there, be quiet and trust. Don't move. Don't go. No, don't get up. Don't raise your hand. Don't 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 try to you know don't don't even bring me a drink of water just just sit there and, and, and be still <laughs> and let me handle this. I, I don't need you to fan me. I, I don't need you to bring me no water. I don't need you to make a suggestion. I just need you to sit there and know that I got you and I'm gonna take care of this and to trust me that I'm gonna take care of this because you know. In my life, it's always been, no, Susan, you got to take care of this. Susan, you got to do this. Susan, you can't trust anyone else to take care of this. But now it's like, no, if it's burning around you, I will bring the water to put the fire out. If it's burning around, we just, we going to walk in this fire together. 
We finna walk this fire together. We gonna talk in this fire together. We gonna have a great conversation. We just finna walk and we gonna observe the fire around you. We gonna have a fun conversation and we just gonna chill. You gonna chill and let me take care of everything else. Cause I got you covered in the fire. You have nothing to worry about. Basically you just actually have a seat. Don't even move. You just sit right there. Huh. Woo! You know what? Here is here is what I love about the Lord. Thank you so much for sharing. <laughs> ah! Listen, the the beautiful thing that I love about what you said is is that sometimes as everything around you seems like it's burning, sometimes we look for God to bring water when He says, "No, I'm gonna make you fireproof right and through here." I I think that a lot of times we look for the way out because that's the easier way out. It's easier for you to extinguish this fire. Come on, I got a little water bottle and I got some ice and this off-brand Stanley and we can make it work. He says, no, I want to make you fireproof and I want you to stand in what I said, stand in my provision. The other thing it, it is that when God has you in a place like this, this is the teaching, <laughs> it is not less necessarily about God providing for you more than it is about God breaking unhealthy patterns and norms in your life. Provision is what I do. It's what I promised. It's who I am. That is that. Is that. I want to break the unhealthy patterns that have said or that have caused you to believe that you must do and you must be and you must. I, I'm coming after that. And I'm doing it by way of this. And as uncomfortable as it is, and as uncomfortable as it can be, and even will be, he says, now, now sit down, sit and rest. There's so many things happening, right? And in just this one thing, teaching you how to rest and stop being a busybody. He's getting to the core of why you're, you're so busy, excuse me in one area or another, and he is making all things beautiful. I'm, I'm done, go ahead, Motorola. Let me be quiet, because I got a lesson to, to teach. Go ahead. Um, it's funny, because I was about to say the same thing. Um, God is teaching me how to sit and just uh, <laughs> listen, and I don't like it, <laughs> because again, I am used to doing, doing it, getting it done. You know, if he gives me a vision, if he gives me something to do, okay, God, I'm like on it, ready to do it. But now I find myself, I can't do anything. I'm in a place where I have to sit and I don't like it because I'm like, it's uncomfortable for me because I'm so used to doing it by myself and I'm so used to standing and I'm like, okay, what do I do? <laughs> and God's like, you just have to sit. And I'm like, well, how long do I have to sit? How long do I have to sit? And yeah, I'm learning how to trust him in this process because it's scary. It is scary. It is uncomfortable for me. I love that. Again, God is doing one thing and there's so many other implications. Hello to everyone watching by way of Facebook. I'm trying to check in and see who is watching. I can't see all of you, but I know some of you all are watching. I can't see your comments because we're here on Zoom, but thank you so much for hanging with us tonight. Um, the other thing that I love about, about what Christine just said is, is that I'm used to doing it alone. Beyond God teaching us to, to let me handle it, he's also showing us, you don't have to do this by yourself. You don't have to be lonely because Jesus is with you. It's the microphone. It's something about the microphone that just makes you want to sing. It's okay. <laughs> Not farmersonly.com, but you don't have to be lonely because I am with you. It's, it's not his will that we do life alone. It's not his will that we go through this life know, not knowing what it is to feel his presence right with us. 
And one of the things that I know about God is that he will specifically and divinely orchestrate seasons of solitude where everyone else around us cannot be there. They, they're just too busy or, or maybe they've got their own things going on and, you know, all of the other things. And because of that, he'll say, now, let me be the one. I'm tired in my body, but this spirit of mine is going on a hundred. He let me be the one. Focus. Come on, Justin, because this is not passion night and you'll be singing and that's not what we're doing tonight. Okay. All right. Focus. Woo. All right. So uh, <laughs> you can put your answers to these questions in the chat. Um, and remember, we're answering or we are answering these questions as students of Jesus. Okay. You're not answering this question based on your norm. You're not answering this question based on any other thing, but we are answering these questions based on being students of Jesus. All right, so question number one, uh, do you consider yourself more of a feeler or a thinker? I personally am a thinker. Uh, I usually lead with head first and, and heart second. <laughs> Sometimes that is great, other times it is not. Uh, but as a student of Jesus, uh, I am more of a thinker, more of a thinker. All right, you all can put your answers in the comments um, or you can take yourself off mute. It's really up to you, depending on how you, uh, what is most comfortable for you, okay? Um, number two, here is my favorite and I do want all of us to answer this question, all right? Uh, what is one skill or ability, one lesson even, right? That you have mastered well enough, I'm saying to teach others is what it's supposed to say. One skill or ability that you have mastered well enough to teach others. <laughs> All right. To the best of my ability. Okay, we've got some thinkers and some feelers. And I want us to talk a little bit about the difference between those two as you're answering number two. All right. What's the one skill or ability you've mastered well enough to teach others? Now, the difference between thinkers and feelers. Here we go. It is not the right answer. Okay, in a classroom, right, that there is, uh, if, if, we, if one plus one is two, that's the problem, right? One plus one is two. The thinker may be able to do it mentally. The, the feeler may have another method. There is, uh, the difference is not the answer of two. The difference is in the process that is taken to arrive at that answer. The difference between thinkers and feelers most often is going to be the process, the journey, sometimes even the length of time that it takes to get from point A to point B. All right. And we see this in the Bible. Paul would be considered in some ways a thinker. Peter would be a feeler. Okay. Right. Moses would be a thinker, right? And it's possible to be a feeling thinker and a thinking feeler, right? There are some moments where you have to do both, but there is nothing wrong with being either or. You just understand that, the, that your process is different because typically the way you process is different. And when it comes down to certain situations, the feeler has to remove themselves from feeling so that they can get to a sober answer. And sometimes the thinker has to empathize and put themselves in the place of feeling so that they can get to the right answer. God help me this night. Okay. As a thinker, sometimes I'm like, well, that's simple. That's dumb. That's, you know, my, my, my response oftentimes comes from the fact of me thinking that logically does not make sense. I, I don't, I don't understand. I don't, I don't, I don't get it. Are we okay? I don't get it. But on the other side of that, one of the things the Lord is teaching me, help me, Holy Ghost, right? He is teaching me to be able to see where another person is coming from. Hey, Amel, good to see you. Thanks for joining. It's teaching me to, to learn where other people are coming from. Here we go. Not to change the way that I am. Okay. He is not teaching me to see things from another person's point of view to change how I am. He is helping me see it from their point of view to draw us closer together in the faith and in relationship. 
so that we can support one another as we are doing this thing called life together. I've got some close friends who are feelers and I'm like, oh my God, just let's let this be done already. I saw the answer to this six months ago. I don't get it. But then on the other side of that, there are some things that I uh, that I struggle to do or to accomplish because that feeling component is lacking. And because a good teacher will oftentimes, I can say this because what I got my master's in, education, whoop, whoop, congratulations to me and the Holy Ghost, right? But because a good teacher knows that their students need not just one-on-one -on -one time with the teacher, but they also need peer learning, a good teacher will put different students in the same group so that they can learn from one another as they're learning from the teacher. I know what I'm talking about. Okay, so the thinker might have to learn with the feeler. And the one who is more kinesthetic may have to learn with the person who is a visual learner. And we're going to come up with a, absolutely, we're going to come up with a, a, a bunch of different activities that drive the same point and that focus on the same thing so that everyone can get helped in their individual ways, but then we can also learn from one another. So we're all going to learn how to do this with counting bears. We're all going to learn how to do this through this song. We're all going to learn how to do this by using mental math. And then after that, you're going to use the method that works best for you as an individual when the time of testing comes. And when the testing comes, it is okay to use a method that you learned elsewhere, help me, so that you can get to the answer. Absolutely. Absolutely so that you can get to the answer. And oftentimes individuals learn better or uh, when they're learning with and from their peers than they will sometimes the teacher. Hallelujah to you, Jesus. All right? <laughs> Woo -wee! All right, uh, let's keep going because I, if I don't, if I don't, I'm gonna lose it. I'm gonna lose it. <laughs> All right. Question number three, are what are the four rhythms of the student of Jesus? What are the four rhythms of the student? I don't know where my blue notebook is, so I'm a cheat. Okay, I'm a cheat. But what are the four rhythms of a student of Jesus? These are the ones we talked about two weeks ago. All right, uh, let's do it. Let's do it. Let's do it. All right, the four rhythms that we do, right? It is here. All right, PJ2, it is here. What's another one? Mm hmm understand absolutely come on notes good here understand practice and encourage come on Susan here understand practice and encourage when it comes to the teachings of Jesus we must first hear them after we hear them we must endeavor to understand them after we understand what the Lord is saying to us we practice that teaching if it is the practice of love, if it's the practice of grace, if it's the practice of understanding, we practice them and then we say, hey, this is what Jesus is showing me. Why don't you come along and join me on this journey? All right. So as students of Jesus, we hear, understand, practice and encourage. All right. Um, number four is what are the four questions of the study partner? All right. These are things I believe that PJ2 went over. Uh, last week, so this should be fresh in your mind. <laughs> All right, what are the questions? There are four questions. <laughs> one of these we ask every week, so you should know one of them off rip. It's the question we started the end of this. I mean, the beginning of this class with. It's one we said we're gonna ask one another every week. All right. Um, I'm going to give you that one since you should already know is what has Jesus been teaching you lately? All right. That is one of the questions. There are three more. What are the other three? Woo. I love this. <laughs> All right. If you're just joining or if you have not been with us, we are reading and going through the book. You smell like Jesus by Stephen Weathers. It is an awesome, awesome read. Um, not a deep read, not a long read, but it is challenging and changing our lives for the better as we become students of Jesus. Yep. Can we pray about it is one. I love that. And this is something that I believe we should start doing more often every in every area of our lives, right? 
I know as friends, as church members, as family members, we love talking and venting about the drama and the things that we don't like and the things that we would want to change and all of these other things. And after that, we hang up the phone or we stop texting and all of these other things. I wonder what would happen to us. I wonder what would happen within us when once we identified something that was wrong, we said, can we pray about it? Absolutely. Uh, the other question was, how is life? All right, what's going on in your life? So how's life? And then there's one more. All right, can we pray about that? Hey, I know that we talked a little bit about, you know, our frustrations with church and the ministry and the service today. Can we pray about that? Before we, I don't want us to leave this space with those negative feelings. Right? After you've identified. And the more you talk, the more you complain, the more you identify is wrong, the more you have to pray about. So can we pray about it? Hey, all right, before we pray, can, let's do a brief recap of the things you said that you saw or that you observed that you would like to change, that you don't feel were right, the moments that were missed in service. Can we pray about those? Yeah, you want to see discipleship on a new level? Let's pray. <laughs> all right, the last question is, what does Jesus teach about this? All right, putting the word on it bringing this full circle all right because it's one thing to pray but we're going to pray into what jesus said so that we're not praying amiss we're going to pray into what he's doing in our lives so that we're not just out here you know throwing darts uh, uh, uh in the dark all right and so understanding that as a student of jesus our lives should be pointed in the direction of always leading people back to him through teaching and by way of prayer and it's oftentimes in those moments of prayer that the lord will begin to speak to us and will begin to reveal sometimes the uh the, the solution or the resolution that needs to uh, take place and give us more to pray into all right so those are the four questions of the study partner now do you uh, or are you more comfortable studying the words of jesus or listening to the holy spirit all right i can go ahead and answer this for myself <laughs> all right um do you feel more comfortable? So I think that for me personally, um, it depends on the situation. Most of what we do, for me, most of what I do, it is often led by Holy Spirit first, and then the words of Jesus come later. You all see this in my teaching style, especially on Sundays or when I have to uh, teach, because most of my messages are prompted by conversations that I have with Holy Spirit. After those conversations, then I'll try to go and find the scripture. Sometimes it doesn't always happen, but I'll try to find a scripture or a verse that ties into the conversation so that there's a deeper foundation for people to kind of go into and study and read. But I personally um, am more comfortable because that's the way that it happens more consistently uh, studying the words of Jesus than I, I'm, I'm sorry, listening to Holy Spirit than I am with studying the words of Jesus, all right? PJ2 said words of Jesus, but I'm learning to love Craig's questions and challenges, and don't he question and challenge? Now, what's the difference, you might be asking? Listening to Holy Spirit is God speaking to you in whatever way he speaks to you, whether that is audible voice, whether that's dreams and visions, whether that is, uh, let, me, let me do it like this. Uh, listening to Holy Spirit is anything outside of what is written in the Bible. So are you more comfortable studying what is written in the Bible or are you more comfortable engaging with God in ways that are outside of that? All right. Words of Jesus for PK. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. All right. And then this last one. I want us to say for the end Engaging with God outside of the Bible. Absolutely, Susan. Me too. It just be just be a thing. All right. This last one I want us to save until the end. But has God helped you overcome any unhealthy habits in the past? And how did that happen? All right. That'll be our closing tidbit, our closing moment. All right. Beautiful. All right. So before we get into the five ladders, that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. Uh, from this book, I just want to give a couple of highlights that stood out to me. Jesus values our morality more than our participation in church activities. 
okay? Here we go. I've said this before. God isn't so concerned about what we do in church, or he's not more concerned about what we do in church than he is the lives that we live outside of that. Okay? Throughout the teachings of Jesus, there are five themes or ladders that lead us to becoming more like him. These ladders provide access to health and wisdom, and these ladders are the what that we practice, and they show us where we go next, all right? So you're going to need your book for this. I didn't type everything verbatim, so we're just going to do some brief overviews, all right? So about these five ladders, let's talk. Each of these ladders is to bring us closer to Jesus. The bottom step, the lowest step is the most basic expectation. And the reality is that much of what we see in the body is people standing on this bottom step. You ain't gone nowhere. You ain't that much far off the ground. You've not elevated. And the question of the Lord really becomes, when are you going to grow up? Right? To all of the bottom step, the, the most basic expectations, the I'm just living out the Ten Commandments, that's, that's too low. That's too low. All right? So climbing the ladder is symbolic of growth and maturity in Christ. And these principles are foundational. They are just the starting points. Thou shall not kill. Great. That is just the starting point. That is not the end all be all. And there is much more to be accomplished uh, as you grow and develop in the faith and in your relationship with God. All right. So ladder number one is agape. Ladder number one is love. On this ladder, we go from taking vengeance to showing compassion to everyone. Now, as we're talking through this, I want you to think about who everyone is and name some specific communities. I'll fix the, the PowerPoint. Uh, name some specific communities that are included in this everyone. This should be fun. And you can type in the chat or you can take yourself off mute, whichever one is e easier for you. Who are some people that are included in everyone? Okay, people in the chat. All right, uh, Caucasian people, LGBT, absolutely. Anyone else? Republicans, <laughs> Trump supporters, murderers, right? Wicked cops, black folk. <laughs> our family members, our coworkers, right? All of these things. And so on this ladder, we go from self-offenders, rapists and molesters, all of them, right? Who is included? Everyone. And so on this ladder of love, we go from taking vengeance, absolutely, to showing compassion to everyone. As we are thinking through this, can you honestly and, and earnestly say that you show or you strive to show compassion to everyone? I want you to think about it. You don't have to put it in the chat. Are there people that you find it difficult to show compassion to? And if so, why? That's where you start. <laughs> right? Because to become like Jesus means we must become like Jesus. And when we read through scripture, there was never a moment where Jesus turned away an opportunity to converse, not, here we go, not convert, not preach to, not even deliver an unbeliever or a person who lived a, a life that was contrary to his word. But he never turned away an opportunity to talk to them, to hear their story, and to find out where they were coming from even though he already knew. If there are people that you find it challenging to talk to, I want you to think about why. And I want you to ask the Lord, why is this difficult for me? 
And Susan, I love your honesty. Susan said, I'm getting better at it, but it's been a hard ladder to climb. And I fell off that first rung a billion times. Baby, let me help you. Still falling, getting up and falling, understanding that we are imperfect, but we are striving to be who it is and what it is God is asking us to be. And the first thing that we must do was learn how to love. I have this saying in this teaching that I do is before we convert, we must converse. I've got to be willing to talk to you, to understand who you are, where you come from, what's your story, how did you get here? Again, this is the difference between a thinker and a feeler. Regardless of who I am or how I am, I cannot uh, allow what you say. I can't allow your story to cloud my vision and my judgment, right? But I've got to be able to stand in this place of sobriety and understand what's going on so that I can become more like Jesus. Here is the reality. The Lord will put people around us that we find it difficult to engage with and struggle with. And, and let me help you with something. Let me make sure I get good up in this mic. When he does that, it's not about them. Woo it is not about them. When he puts you in the presence of the type of people or the communities that you don't like, the ones you roll your eyes at, the ones you turn your nose up at, it's not about them. It's about you. He is revealing something to you about you. And he's saying, now, give me that. He'll stop you in your tracks and say, why you do that? Why did you look at her that way? Why did you look at him that way? And it has nothing to do with you living that life. It has nothing to do with you being that way, but it has everything to do with you choosing to love God and to be like him, and to love like him, and to smell like him. You ever hug somebody and then when you leave their presence, when you are no longer embracing them, whatever cologne or perfume they have on, it is on you, and it's always something peony smelling, <laughs> right? It's white diamond, it's red door, it's that something that is like, I. You, you hugged her too? Yeah, because we both, yep, I smell it on you. And this is how close Jesus wants us to be to him. So much so that when he embraces us, when we leave his presence, we never stop smelling like him. That don't happen when you dab him up. That happens when you embrace him. So on this ladder, we go from taking vengeance. And taking vengeance isn't necessarily about revenge. It's the things you say, the things you feel when you come into their presence or when they come into yours. And it is you checking those things at the door and saying, Lord, deliver me from this. Because again, it's not about them, it's about you. Now, before we go to the next one, and I want you to take this thought with you as we go through all of the ladders, what do you notice about this ladder? This ladder in particular, what do you notice about it? You can take yourself off mute or you can put it in the chat. All right. It narrows the higher you go up. Baby, if you're going to do this thing, that's exactly it, Susan. If you're going to do this thing the way Jesus is asking you to do it, you're going to have to let some of that stuff go. You're going to have to shed some pounds. You're going to have to shed some of that nasty attitude. You're going to have to shed some of the ways that are just not like God. It's easier to stop. It's easy to stop doing a little stuff at the bottom. Right here in the book, it says, uh, don't murder. That's the minimum expectation. Don't murder. Don't kill nobody, right? Physically, emotionally, mentally, spiritually, don't kill anybody. That's the lowest expectation. Then he climbs up, stops at the middle, stands on it and says, don't be angry with a brother. That's a higher expectation. So maybe I'm not angry enough to kill you, but I still don't like you. I'm still holding a grudge. Yep, but don't do that either. Right? Because for some of us, the idea of murder is preposterous. But the idea of being angry and staying angry is not. So uh, don't do that either. 
Then Jesus turns and takes a seat, balancing on the top step of the ladder and says, love your enemies the way God loves them. Woo so, so with all the people we just talked about, right, all the communities, absolutely, the wall is holding it up. I love that. With all the communities that we just listed, the Republican, the Trump supporter, the rapist, the molester, the sex offender, those in the LGBTQ, Caucasians, and all the rest, guess what? God loves them too. I have to cut my fan on. Huh? It says, it says, Matthew 5 and 44, love your enemies the way God loves them. So you mean to tell me God loves them? Absolutely. And you must do the same. And you must do the same. Here we go. Here we go. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I need a yes in the chat. Can you hear me? Can you hear me? Not only do we have to love them, we must love them the way he does. Woo and if we spent more time trying to do that, we wouldn't have time to be trying to run around and gossip about who's doing or not doing, who's going or not going, because we would recognize I'm trying to climb Jacob's ladder. Mm -mm. I'm trying to climb Jesus's ladder so that I can become and smell more like him. Oh, I know. I know. I know. I know it sucks. I know it's difficult because we would love to hold it over their heads and tell them that you must do and you must be and you must. Hey, 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 love them the way that I love them. <laughs> so, Father, show us how you love your people. And not just the people that have named you as their Lord, their Savior and their God, but those that have not. Show us how to love them too. Yeah. 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 So these supporting agape rungs, right, are lessons such as forgiving because all of these fall under the category of agape. The reason that I put those things on the side is because those things hold up this ladder on the side. Yes, it's supported by the wall and all of those things. It gets more narrow as you go up. But then there are some things on the side. Forgiveness, making peace inclusion brotherly love all of those things are on this ladder they support it those are the little pillars on the side because guess what if you try to step on one of these rungs and those side pillars aren't there you still gonna be down to the ground so let me show you how to walk in love with forgiveness first then let me show you how to make peace then let me show you how to include other people, not just the people you like, not just the people you get on with, not just the people that look like you, talk like you, believe like you, go to your church in your same denomination of reformation. Let me show you how to include other people because that's what I did. And then let me show you how to love them as, as your brothers and sisters in Christ. All right. That's ladder number one. This only number one. All right. Now, ladder number two. What you say out that mouth, them words, all right? On this ladder, we go from speaking hurtful lies to speaking powerful blessings. Here we go, with a pure heart. Have you ever prayed a prayer and said, Lord, bless them uh, out of your mouth, but in your heart, you ain't mean it? It was just me? Okay. It was just me who had prayed that prayer like that? Okay. Lord, touch him. Lord, keep him. Lord, bless him. And I didn't even mean it. I just was doing it because I felt like it was what I was supposed to do. Hey, all down to the Facebook. That's what I believed I was supposed to do. So because I believed that I was supposed to do it, I did it. I didn't mean it. I was trying to talk myself <laughs> into being saved or talk myself into whatever it was I was trying to talk myself into. No, 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 no. Not just speaking powerful blessings, dot, 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 with a pure heart. And my heart will not be pure unless I get delivered. Susan said, that's what I was taught that I needed to do to get into heaven. I was taught that similarly. Just speak the word and just pray for me. Just, no, I'm mad. So Lord, let me give you my anger first. Let me, let me give you this grudge first. 
then we can talk on speaking powerful blessings with a pure heart. Because right now, my idea of you blessing them would be for them to get ran over on their feet. Don't kill them. Just run their feet over. Can we be honest? <laughs> Just run their toes over. Let them feel a little pain right quick. Not on this ladder. All right? So the bottom rung of this is keep your oaths. Right? Don't swear awfully, off, falsely, I'm sorry, and don't take an oath in God's name unless you intend to keep it. These are two of the Ten Commandments, all right? That's Exodus 20, verses 7 and 16, all right? That's basic. Don't lie, essentially. Be a person of your word. Word is bond, all right? Middle rung, don't be the kind of person who needs to swear an oath. So not only are you saying tell it, uh, keep your word, but don't be the type of person where keeping your word I got to even be considered. Be the kind of person who speaks the truth all the time. That's the middle. All right. And then the top says, if you remain in me, here we go. And my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. Now, here we go. God wants to honor our words. Let's stop right there. Let's breathe and let's live and rejoice in the fact that God wants to honor what we say. Again, this is, this is if you remain in me and I remain in you. So again, we talked about it in this ladder of love, loving and smelling like him, that close embrace. Now here on ladder number two, we see another thing happening. God wants us close. He wants to honor our words. He wants to make them powerful. Jesus is daring us to let our words become so pleasing to God that he looks forward to hearing them. I was reading this at, at, at work today, and I almost told them people co-work space up. Why? Because I recognize that Jesus wants to honor what I say and that there is a moment or that there is a place of relationship that we get to in God where he looks forward to what we say. I look forward to Justin praying. I look forward to Jamel and Christine and Susan and Janine and Kimber. I look forward to them praying. Why? Because I know that when they pray, they're going to pray my will and then I'm going to perform. Yeah, they're going to pray my will and then I am going to do what I promised I would do. Jesus is sitting at the top of the ladder daring us to speak words that are so full of truth, goodness, and life that he can say, amen, let it be so to every word we say. Woo! We are now saying, amen, so let it be, and be it unto me according to thy word, to the words Jesus speaks. But what happens when we allow him to draw us so close that when we speak, he says, amen, it'll be done according to what you say. Father, take us to that place where not only do we agree with your word, but you agree with ours. Woo! As people who, fo excuse me, who follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit always keeps us on one of these ladders. This is something we just got to know. You always on a ladder. And you might visit the same ladder more than one time in your life. Okay? Ladder number three is trust. On this ladder, we go from trusting in money or any other source to trusting in God the Father to meet all of our needs. The book talks a lot about money, but it's not just that, all right? All right, at the bottom rung, he said, don't steal. Don't take what isn't yours. That's the bare minimum because God is never going to address the action. He wants to get down to the root because why are you stealing? Middle rung, you don't need to worry about your basic needs. Your heavenly father will take care of them because he loves you like a child. So we have parents on here. And parents, you know, when your children ask for something, what do you do? Talk to me, parents. Talk to me, mamas. When your child needs something or when your child asks for something, you might say, y'all need that. But what you doing behind the scenes? You can come off mute for this one because I know you know it. Somebody said, break my bike to deliver. Huh? 
what you do? You trying to figure out, okay, well, okay, well, I, I ain't paying you no mind, but you're trying to figure out if I save a little bit from this check, and if I save a little bit from that check, and if I put this to the side, and if I put this, then I find a way to get it done. So on the bottom level is don't steal. On that middle level, it is believe Jesus to supply your needs. Because he loves you like a child. On the top of the ladder of trust, he says, everything you give away in love will come back with eternal dividends. Proverbs 19, 17. When God asks you to give, do it quickly and cheerfully. 2 Corinthians 9 and 7. He is inviting you to invest in eternity. So God wants to take me. Here we go. God wants to take me from don't steal. I'll provide to give your stuff away. Ah! He wants to take me from being a hoarder to a sower. He wants to take me from being one who is tight grasped and tight handed with the things that I have to being one who sows and his promise is that I will always give seed to the sower. Here's the other thing that we've got to think about or, or be excited about on this ladder of trust is that it's not just for money. It's not just your financial needs. This is also for emotional needs, such as friendship, understanding, intimacy, delight, and respect. Because to only be focused on God providing money and be a bankrupt in every other area of your life, it is not God, it's not his nature. It's not his character, all right? But trusting God to meet our physical and emotional needs, here we go, sets us free to give without reservation. I'm going to say it one more time for the people down to the Facebook. Trusting in God to meet our physical and emotional needs sets us free to give without reservation. Not just of our money, but of ourselves. You ever been in a relationship with somebody or with people that you felt like you just couldn't quite be vulnerable with? How was that experience for you? I want to say, but I don't because I don't want to be judged and I don't want to be, uh-uh, no, 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 no. And this place of trust is, I, I'm going to just give of myself without reservation. Right? And so looking at it from that perspective, that's the third ladder. So we've got love, right? We're on that ladder of love, learning how to love like Jesus. Ladder number two is learning how to speak and talk like Jesus. Ladder number three is learning how to trust like Jesus. Do you not know that when Jesus was down there, hung him high, they stretched him wide. He hung his head for you and me. He died, that's love. Do you, that was trust. I gotta trust that the sacrifice you are asking me to make is going to be worth it. And I'm giving myself without reservation. Woo! I'm giving of myself without reservation. I'm giving of myself without even thinking twice about what's going on. Maybe thinking a third time because I had thought twice because I was in the God ads and saying like, hey, if we can do this another way, let's do that. But I'm giving of myself freely. Having a conversation with my son the other day, I said, you've got to see everything you do as an opportunity uh, to give. Everything you do is you giving. And so when God is talking about how he loves a cheerful giver, he's not just talking about your money. He's talking about everything you do, every conversation you have, every ministry moment and opportunity. That too is you giving. Do so cheerfully. God is not only asking us to give cheerfully, he is asking us to trust cheerfully. To trust cheerfully. All right, ladder number four is flesh. It is the ladder of the flesh, being generous givers. Of course, understanding that there are some folks, right, where you may be willing, but God will say, hey, listen, come out of there. Come on out of there, because God has them in a the process as well. And sometimes our giving will become enabling and it will become a crutch for them. But being willing to give, that's that's more than, it, it's, it's more than the act of giving, and it's more about your willingness. Excuse me, because sometimes you may be willing, and the Lord will say no. 
Sometimes you really may want to do so in your heart. And the Lord will say, mm -mm, not this time. Why? Because maybe the Lord is teaching them a lesson in faith. All right. I'm not going to get into that, but you, you get me? Y'all got me? Good. All right. On the ladder of flesh, we climb from being controlled by the desires of our body to being set apart to serve God. All right. Bottom rung, don't have sex with another man's wife or cheat on your wife. Don't commit adultery. That's the minimum expectation from the Ten Commandments. Don't be around here doing the things with the people and the things. Okay? But that's too low. As you grow in Christ, as you grow in God, some, like, okay, that's not a thing. What's next? How can I push this a little further? All right? Take extreme measures if necessary to keep that temptation from growing. Because this ain't just about getting a little thing thing. This is about anything that tempts you. If you got to take extreme measures, take them. Why? So that you stop that temptation from growing. You know what this causes you to do? This causes you to be aware of your triggers. What is it that's going to keep this thing active and alive in my life? What is it that's going to feed this temptation? And when I understand that, then guess what? I can uh, put boundaries in place so that it's no longer a thing for me. Okay, emotional gluttony. Talk here. I've got to be mindful of the things that I am and I'm not doing. I must be. So that I don't find myself on the other side of this thing. Right? That's the next rung. Then, but then we get to the middle. It's not just for sex and marriage. Everybody got a vice. Right? Christine started talking about eating. Right? Everybody got a vice. For some, it's food. For others of us, it's shopping. Down to the corner of them. I don't know who us is. Even though I got us in my name. Jay, you at... I, it's that, right? But let's get to the bottom of that. Why is this a thing for you? Okay? Pray and talk to God about these struggles when you want to give in to these unhealthy cravings. And the top ladder, the top rung of the ladder is uh, God wants us to be free from slavery to these destructive patterns so that we can genuinely love others. Again, it's about love. It's about love. So when I'm not being ruled by my flesh, I can be devoted to the Lord. Uh, not hopelessly, but wholly devoted to the Lord. Right? Wholly devoted to him. Because not only does he, uh, is he the Lord of my spirit, he's the Lord of my body. I present my body so you can use my body. Okay. Y'all ain't ready. Yeah. Because again, the reality is, if my spirit is willing, but my body ain't there, the work still won't get done. <laughs> Listen, if I only do half of it, then the, then the work won't get done. Because if God needs me to go into a certain place and I'm not there at that place he wants me to be in, it's not getting done. It's not getting done. All right. So it's not just about those uh, light things. All right. It is about us learning to give of our flesh and it's about us learning to move on so that we can do and be who it is God is calling and asking us to be. All right. Last one. On the other side of that, going back to the last one. Hold on. Hold on. All right. The flesh. We need to understand how to avoid temptation and these things before it happens. Number one. And we need strategies to deal with it after it becomes an issue. One of the things I often had to do as a teacher when some of my students were, were acting out is that we had to uh, uh, fill out these forms. They were called ABC forms. What happened before the behavior, right? What happened during the behavior? And then what happened afterwards? I think that if we started doing these things in our own lives, if we started looking at, okay, you know what, I failed yesterday, but what happened right before I did that? 
Oh, yeah. You really want to talk deliverance? You've got to look and see what's going on in your own life. I failed, but what was I experiencing? What was I listening to? What kind of conversations was I having right before that moment happened? And when you identify that, you know what boundaries and parameters to put in place so that you don't go. But remember, in order to stay free from your flesh, you need two things to understand how to avoid it before it happens. And if something happens and it's not avoidable, what is the strategy to deal with the after it becomes an issue? All right. Ladder number five, pride. Okay, pride. On this ladder, we go from putting others down to appreciating the lost and despised. I'll fix it before I send the replay. All right, putting others down. Bottom rung of this ladder, right? As if squashing the book, don't use lies and four letter words to kill someone's reputation and make them feel worthless. All of the sharing and posting and clicking and liking that we do to share and spread other folks' business, pride, right? Do that in the wrong way and you might be committing a crime. Don't slander. This is a basic rule of civil society. You go to jail, the people will sue you for slandering them. Defamation of character, right? But that's that's too low. That's basic. That's a... That's a thing of human decency. Unbelievers teach their children that. So there's got to be something more, all right? Then he steps up one rung. If you assume that other people are fools because you don't like what they say and do, you might be cheating yourself out of some heavenly wisdom. Try listening to them and be curious about their point of view. This is where I'd start asking people, okay, show me how you got there. I don't get it. I don't understand. I would like to help me get to that point. How did you get there? Walk me through your process. Walk me through it. Walk me through it. All right. Down to the middle. It's better not to judge others. You don't know what they're going through. It's better to assume that they have their struggles just like you do. Believe that they have good intentions and sincerely want to honor God like you do. Did he just say, let's let's read that again. I need to hear it again. And I pray that you do too. It's better not to judge others. That's simple. All right. Now, you don't know what they're going through because context matters. To the person with a million dollars going in the store to steal, we're going to look at you and be like, but why did you do that? You got a million dollars. But to the, to, to the homeless child, to the family who was food insecure, it doesn't make stealing right. But the context of this situation helps us look at them through eyes of compassion and love. Okay? Eyes of compassion and love. So we see these things happening. All right? You don't know what they're going through. It's better to assume that they have their struggles just like you do. Believe that they have good intentions and sincerely want to honor God just like you do. Now, do you sincerely want to honor God and do you have good intentions? That's the question. Bringing us into this sober reality so that we can become more like Jesus. All right, next one. Focus on fixing yourself. Yeah, other people have problems, but don't focus on the issues. Focus on yours. Again, we just talked about it. Everything God shows us. Even though it might include other people, it's a lesson about us. Huh? You see the person walking down with the short skirt and a tight shirt, and you looking, and, and your first reaction is, well, why did she put that on? Why are you looking? What's going on in your body as you look? This is about you. You see the man walking, he's so fine, he blow my mind, muscle, whatever your type is, that's my type, yeah, that's my type. All of your things, okay. Let's focus on what's going on in your body. I let him walk by you for a reason. Now let's deal with the reason. Let's, let's get to the bottom of the reason. It's not about him. It's about you. It's about you. Okay? So again, let's keep going. Now he sits on the top of the ladder. When we dignify and value people, 
the way God values them, they feel drawn to us. And that's when we can have a conversation. That's when we can share and spread the love and the word of God. They care about what we say, and we are curious about how God is working in their lives. We are delighted to be around them, and they are thrilled to be around us. Pride says, you know what? Oh, no. Like the peacock, I got these uh, feathers and these things, and everyone wants to look at me. But pride says, no, you too got something you can show off. So let's walk together. I'm not better than you. I'm just different than you. I'm not better. I'm just different. I'm just different. All right. So uh, God is writing these laws on our hearts. We're just about done. So that the thought of violating these low level commandments becomes too low for us. It's just too low. For me to keep going over certain things, it is just too low. And like any other parent, any other friend, at some point, you're just going to stop having certain conversations. Oh, I'm not I'm not addressing that no more. After two years, I'm not addressing that. What's next? What are we moving on to? Right? We move on from that place. Okay? Uh, The other thing we've got to recognize about the word of God is that the teachings of Jesus seem to build on one another. They're progressive. All right? Here's some closing thoughts. Just like a ladder, the teachings of Jesus are progressive. I did this at work, y'all. Please forgive me. I know how to spell. (laughs) All right. They're progressive and they build on one another. When we get one, it unlocks a perspective that helps us understand the next. But the teachings of Jesus, there's always a rung on these ladders that we can climb. Okay, the progression helps us have grace for others, those who are not where we are. But it also helps us have grace for us as we take the steps. Okay, so you've got to have grace for you and grace for other people. All right, different parts of the Bible are more specific, um, are more useful for specific situations and seasons of our lives. Okay, we've also got to know that some things are going to be more pronounced and more prominent in one season than they are in another. But there is grace for both, just like I'm on a ladder, you on a ladder, and we might be on different ones at different seasons of our lives, at different moments in our walk with Christ, but we are still on a ladder. All right. So let's go back to the question we asked at the beginning because we're done. All right. Uh, Has God helped you overcome any unhealthy habits in the past? And how did that happen? All right. As we're closing out, I want us to share just those things. God, and maybe he is in the process of helping you. Like me, there are some things God is helping me through, helping me out of. One of those is my perception of people. Y'all pray hard, okay? Pray hard. Because it's challenging sometimes to deal with. And again, most of these things come from the fact that I'm a thinker. I'm a thinker. And I'm not a feeler. And so when people respond to things in certain ways, it doesn't compute for me. And so my typical response is to dismiss it. He's like, yeah, no. I wouldn't do that, so you can't either. Pray. (laughs) Pray. So has God or is God helping you through any unhealthy habit? And if so, what is it? What is that habit? What is that habit? Uh, You can take yourself off mute or you can share it in the chat, whichever one is easier for you. And this will be it because we're closing. Amen and the Holy Ghost. Go ahead. Well, one thing he's teaching me is to, and I'm still learning this. Um, it is, um, <laughs> it is um, being sympathetic to people, um, like teaching me patience when it deals with people. Because my thing is, if you know better, why are you not doing better? So he's teaching me that because sometimes I don't have that much patience for people. Mm-hmm. And I feel like they know what they're doing is wrong. So he's teaching me that. 
Yeah. And that's honest. I know you know better. And because you know better. Right? Certain things we just feel like we shouldn't have to do. But then he's like, okay. Let me be the judge of that. Let me be the one who decides. Let me be the one who builds in that area. All right. Thank you so much for sharing. Anyone else? To not use my insecurity as fuel. That's a big one. To rest in, in, in the security that we do have as we move on and do what it is God is asking us to do. Absolutely. Anyone else? He has taught me to quit talking down about myself, quit self-loathing mm -hmm. myself, and to love myself and to know my worth and to see me as he sees me as his child. That's the benediction right there. That's That's it. Because... And I'm guilty of that as well. When you say certain things to yourself, although it's like, oh, it's just a joke and it, no, that's coming from a place. And the reason that comes from a place is because you believe it. 